Good evening, everyone on the Zoom line and good evening, everyone on the phone line. It is good to be with you all this evening. It is good to see your faces. I want to take a moment to shout out Reverend Leslie for her last two nights of strong biblical teaching. May God bless you and continue to bless you as you continue to lead and do teach the word of God. So good to see so many faces tonight. And, and it's so good to hear voices prior to the, the call tonight, knowing that there are many who are on the phone that are ready to hear the word of God. We are about to close out the book of Nehemiah. We're about to finish this journey. And, as I, and I remember today to remind y'all, the book of Nehemiah is the last historical book um, of the Old Testament. It started in, in the book of um, the book of Genesis um, the, the, and, and, and continues all the way here through the, Nehemiah. We remember it, it started out course, with Adam and Eve. We see uh, uh, a family in Genesis become a, 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 a larger family. A family reunion in the end of Genesis turned into a, a, a group of people who had lived in slavery. That slavery group of people turned into a nation. That nation of people turn, turned into a traveling group of people who were headed to the land that God had promised them. That group became a nation, uh, under the, uh, initially under Saul, later under David. That group grew and grew and began to be so prosperous under Solomon that they had covered um, as, really as far, as far as I could see. But after uh, Solomon's disobedience, that same group of folk, uh, found themselves in trouble and turmoil, uh, a divided kingdom, a kingdom that ultimately was taken into captivity, both northern and southern kingdoms. And then uh, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, those people who have been taken to Babylonian captivity, still the people of God, have now come back. And so as we come to this place in Nehemiah, what we hear after this, because the book of Esther is a, is a, it's kind of like it's pulled out of, it's, a, it's, it's, it doesn't continue to record the history. It pulls out of a time period. So it's a period piece, the book of Esther. So Nehemiah is the last of the historical um, chronicling of the, of the people of Israel. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because it shows us, again, um, I want to slow down here. The, oh, this, this, what we've read in, in Nehemiah, what we have watched throughout the course of Israel's history is recorded in the Bible, demonstrates a couple of things. The greatness of God, the frailty of God's people, and the need for God's people to trust God in everything. That's what it shows us. That's what I'm, I see very clearly. God is great, period. God's people are, are can be can be somewhat, how do I want to say this, suspect. That's B. And 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 the way to, to the way to victory, the way the way to experience the power of God is through obedience to God in every circumstance and situation, period. That, that's what it boils down to. And so understanding that as we come to the very end of the book of Nehemiah, we see um, Nehemiah having to address some things that he's already addressed. A broken people become a strong people. A strong people become a revived people. A revived people become uh, a, a respectful people, a resolved people to do what God has called them to do. That's what we see. Now, keeping that context in mind, keeping that in mind, let's go just a little bit further. Keeping that in mind, we then see that those same people, unfortunately, are weakened to the point where they fall back into the into the things that they promised that they would not do. Now, I don't want us to be discouraged because this is a lesson for us. Everything we see in the book of Nehemiah is a lesson. And not only how to have revival, because we talked about that, but it's also a lesson on how to stay con convicted, how to stay connected, and how to stay in communion with God. That's what we see. And so as we look at chapter 13, uh, the other day, the last time I was here with you, teaching uh that we see that, that that nehemiah has come back and he has seen all these issues he addresses the issue of of the the temple being used as a uh a storage space for the gentile the the, the sin ballot uh later we see that 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 that, that they had stopped focusing on doing that which god had told them to do and taking care of the levites the porters the singers and the priests and he set that straight and then later we see that they were they were no longer letting the Sabbath be holy, but the Sabbath becomes just another day for commerce. And he addressed that. And I got to just do a quick state reminder. What did he do? <clears throat> he threatened the people of God not to not to go and do that anymore. He locked the gates and the people who hung around the gates. Y'all remember what he did? He threatened to lay hands on them. He threatened to put some hands on them. And so at, at the end of chapter, at the end of uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 22, um, two, um, he had made this challenge, but initially in verse 20 and 19 and 20, he had assigned some of his close um, compatriots, some of his right hand men to watch the gates to make sure that it was not utilized for commerce, but instead to keep the Sabbath holy. Again, what is this about for us today? This is about making God the priority. This is about not letting the world infect or affect how we focus on God. 
This is about making the, 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 the things that God wants us to do paramount and making everything else extra and ancillary. And so what Nehemiah did in chapter 13, verse 22, is after that he had established a baseline, after he established a baseline of, of what needs to be done on the wall, verse 22 says, and I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. He says that once he got everything established, he assigned it to the Levites. It was the right thing to do. Why? Because the Levites had a responsibility to God. They had a special, unique responsibility to God. And as a result, it was really their responsibility to make sure that the temple of God and the place of God and the city of God did not get used for anything other than the things of God. Now, I used to think, well, the preachers of the Levites, no, no, in the, in the New Testament concept, all of us who are children of God have that same and special relationship. The unique, the, the Levites were specifically chosen. God's chosen people, Israel, had another group who was specifically chosen by God to be his people. And, and, and understand that context, in the book of Ephesians, we are chosen. In the book of First Peter, we are the elect. So we can't say that this is for those people. It's our work to maintain, maintain the things of God. The next thing Nehemiah says in chapter 22, it says, remember me, oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. On the one hand, he was asking God to remember what he did uh, to try to make uh, live according to God's will. But if you read it carefully, he says, remember me, oh my God, concerning this. Remember me, God, in this situation right here. Because you saw what they were doing, and I, I tried to make it right. But then he says, spare me, have mercy on me, according to the greatness of thy mercy. Because as any good leader does, Nehemiah took responsibility for what had taken place in the 10 to 12 years that he had left after chapter 12. So he didn't say it's their fault. He didn't say it was them. He said, Lord, spare me because even though I've gotten it back right, Lord, spare me because it must have been something I've done. This is not him being a victim. This is just Nehemiah coming to the realization that as a leader, as a God appointed, God a strengthened, God-directed, God-protected leader, that it was essential for him to take some level of responsibility. And again, if you remember, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't by his attention because the book of Nehemiah was written as a diary, as a journal. And so this was how he felt, Lord, spare me according to the greatest of thy mercy. He points out this, and I think this is a great place for us to think about. He said, Lord, your mercy is great. And so I know to spare me, not punish me, for what I may deserve in this situation. And I think that's a very confident place. I can imagine when he laid down that night after having jotted this down in his journal, he felt a level of comfort, not in, in the fact that he had done right, but in the fact that God's mercy was great. And I think that's what we ought to, to, to hold on to every day, that God's mercy is so fantastic. God's mercy is so great uh, that we take comfort in his mercy as opposed to taking comfort in who we are and what we've done right. Now, let's pick up in verse 23. That's why I want to jump on the night. And we're going to see if we can wrap, walk through this. Now, in addition to all that he has seen, in addition to the the the, the utilization of uh, Eliashib, the priest, to yet Tobiah used the temple as a whole a storage area, in addition to the fact that they had neglected the house of God, in addition to, in addition to the fact that they allowed God to become a place of commerce as opposed to a place of worship and focus on God, in addition to all that, uh, Nehemiah said there was another problem. What was the problem, Nehemiah? Nehemiah says, in those days also saw our Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. Now, if you remember the beginning of chapter 13, they read the word. And in reading the word, they were reminded that they were to not interact, intermingle, or allow in their presence Ammon and Moab. These people had deliberately tried to misuse, had deliberately tried to, to, to per persuade to influence to, for a negative cause the people of Israel as they came out of the bondage of Egypt on the way to the promised land. Now, understanding that reality, they were told not to be bothered with them, not to intermingle with them. But what Nehemiah said is the great tragedy, and of course, we know Ashdod was an idol god of the Philistines. We know that. And so as a result, Nehemiah says in verse 23, it's almost like he's saying, man, can't, it's almost, here's what he's saying. It. Man, I can't even believe what I saw. I saw Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And, and then he went on, verse 24, says, you know what the problem was? What the problem, Nehemiah? Their children spake half in the speak, speech of Ashdod, but could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. In other words, their compromise was so complete that these, these Jews that had, these men that had married wives of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, 
they, their children did not even speak Hebrew. They spoke Ashdod. Can you, you, you can see that being a problem, right? You can see that being a problem. That the people of God, children, didn't even speak the language of God. I'm going to let y'all sit up a minute. The people of God, their, their children did not speak the language of God. One of the challenges I feel that we face in the world today, I'm going to go ahead and talk turkey, is that we, the church, has allowed the, the technology in the world to assist us in, in our tra raising and training our kids today. I, I got to say it. And I'm talking about, I ain't pointing fingers. I'm saying the church. And what we've done is we've allowed, growing up, St. Peter in, in Blantown. Let me see who on here from Blantown. Anybody on here from Blantown? Reverend Stanley might have been there. Let me see. I don't know if the I don't know if they ever saw here tonight. But one of the things, and, I, and I'm not. I'm sure it just wasn't Blantown. I'm sure whatever church you grew up in, um, that that in, whether it was in Augusta or Atlanta. One of the things that have Buffalo, wherever's that, wherever's going on, Alabama, where it was okay. One of the things I think that, that we allowed to happen in was extracurricular activity to include the church. The church was what we need to do. Football, baseball, basketball was extracurricular. And, and as a result, that was a level of foundation to understand the world, the word of God. So train up the train up the child the way he should go. What does it say? And when he gets old, he won't do what? Hi. He won't depart from it. Y'all okay, y'all got me. Y'all we together. And so what's happening here uh, is, is what sometimes happens in the world today. We've allowed church to become extra. If you got time, you participate in church. And as a result, some of our children don't speak the language of faith. They don't speak the language of 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 of, of the Lord is my light and my salvation. They don't speak the Lord the, the language of uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shut up. Well, that's another. That's a that's a foreign language to them. And I think that's something we need to consider as we get prepared to go back to church. That it's not extra. It becomes primary. It becomes essential for us, our kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, neighbors, all these things, to be more involved and more engaged in in the in, in the work of God. And in the word of God, so that they may be strengthened in this world, as opposed to the world speaking to them. Every time we have to do something at work about gangs and and, and water boy situations, it's, it comes from a lack of 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 of, of, of groundedness and a lack of knowledge of God. Well, why kids do anything? And it's not just black kids. I'm talking about kids. Period. Why did you do anything? Because there's no foundation of God. If you have foundation of God, is if while you may drift, you come back because there's that foundation. And so this is what was happening in Israel. At this time, the people, the children of God and the grandchildren of the people who had come back were marrying idol gods, marrying women of idol gods and, 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 and the language of God became secondary. And he went on to say this a little further. Now watch this. He said, and I contended with them. You know what that means? Whenever he says I contended with them, that means he fussed with them. He argued with them. He, he said, and he cursed them. And look what verse 25 says. Y'all read verse 25. He, he argued with them. He cursed them. And he smacked some people. He smacked certain of them, and he plucked out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. So he was so intense about keeping God first and keeping anything that would dilute the communion that God's people had with God that he got physical. Now, he got physical, he smacked some people, and he made them swear by God. Now, here's what's disturbing. This, what he's asking them to do in 13, 25, chapter 13, verse 25, is what they had promised to do back in 10, 11, and 12. They had promised they wouldn't marry other uh, people from other nations. They promised that. They said, we ain't going to do it. And here he has to remind them. And I can imagine this took a, had an impact on Nehemiah as a leader. And I can imagine it caused him to be somewhat, somewhat disoriented. Because, wait a minute, it's just been 12 years, and they've already walked off the deep end. And what this is a reminder for us is, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is that it is easy living in this world to drift away from God if you're not deliberate about focusing on God. If you're not making every day a, a day that you take time out to focus on God, it is easy for the winds of this world to blow us away from where God wants us to blow us. Uh, I got a, I saw this storm morning last night, and I said, let me go ahead and take down my patio furniture and lay it down on the ground so it won't get blown away. Because the last time we had a storm, uh, I found one of my um, umbrellas over there in my neighbor's yard. I, did, I was looking for it all day, but I finally found it over there in his yard. But I took them down because I wanted them to be stable. I didn't want them to get blown around. That's what we got to do sometimes. We, sometimes we got to get down. What does that mean? Get, our, get on our knees. Get on our faces before the Lord so that we won't get blown away by the restless seas of time, by this restless wind in this world, the, wor the, wor the winds of of, 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 of of anger, the winds of hatred, the, the winds of intolerance, the winds of, of, of disconnection from God's people and focus on self. We got to get away from that by focusing more on God. So we got to 
uproot ourselves and our habits, uproot ourselves in popular culture and lay down before the Lord that we may find ourselves rooted in him as opposed to be blown by the wind of the world. So he says this in verse um, 26. He says now, and he says to them, he said, now listen, don't y'all remember Solomon, the king of Israel? Don't y'all remember he sinned by doing these same things, by marrying women of other nations who were, who were idol worshipers? And as a result, it affected him. He said, in, in Solomon, he said, verse 26, uh, was there was no king like him in all the world. And he was beloved of, of his God. God loved him. And God made him king of all Israel. Nevertheless, he did outlandish women. He did that even the, him did outlandish women cause the sin. In other words, he's saying if Solomon, who God loved and who loved God, got in the same situation, surely uh, Israel, that you all will find yourselves in the same way. In other words, the sin, and this is not about racism. I want to be clear. This is about God's people focusing on God. That's all this is about. This is not about somebody man, somebody black or white. That's not what it's about. It's about the people of Israel, God's chosen people, not caring enough about maintaining godly things. They began to marry women of other nations, and instead of trans, instead of um, um, converting them to, to, to being followers of God, they instead were converted to being followers of the world. And that happens today. And I'm not talking about marriage and I'm talking about just in the world. People get, make a choice. People say, well, I just, the world is more convenient or the world is more comfortable or more world to make me feel bad. The world doesn't judge me as opposed to saying, you know what? God loves me. And even if God chooses to judge us, he's not going to ju judge us unjustly, but he's going to judge us by his love. And so it's important for us to understand that, that the sin of being distracted by this world affected the, the, the one man Solomon, who had truly, 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 truly sought God and asked God for his wisdom, but yet in, in, in marrying women of other nations, of getting, letting his focus leave God, he found himself destroyed, and quite frankly, a nation was destroyed as well. Now, verse 27, here's what Nehemiah says. He said, now, understanding this, shall we then hearken unto you or do all this great evil to trans transgress against our God and marry strange wives? He's saying, now, listen, recognizing that Solomon made this mistake, won't you not listen to yourselves, but instead understand that it's important for you to keep a heart and keep a mind on God so that you will not transgress against God and marry strange wives, in i.e., in losing focus of God. And one of the sons of Joida, and he, he, it's almost like he said, if that wasn't bad enough, verse 28, he says, one of the sons of Joida, who was, the son of Eliab, the high priest, the same guy we talked about early in chapter 13, who's who had married, who had rented room to Tobiah. Tobiah was his boy. That's what it said. So him and Tobiah were close. His son married Tobiah, I'm sorry, Sanballat's daughter. And 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 in doing so, his son Jehida, whose daddy Eliasha was a priest, has not only, look at this, the priest's son has not only um married somebody from another nation, but he has allowed that to distract him from God. So the priest whose work primarily was to go before God on behalf of his people has now allowed something else to distract him. So how can he be an effective intercessor if he has allowed the world to take his mind off of God? How, how can he be effective? If his wife and his children are learning uh, the language of the world as opposed to the language of God, how can he be effective as an intercessor before God on behalf of his people? So look at what Nehemiah said he did. Nehemiah said, I chased him from me. Nehemiah said, I ran him out of the city. I ran him out of, out of Jerusalem. I ran him out of the, the, the temple. Why? Because he had, did, had not displayed himself in true leadership. It's important for leadership. It's important for the people of God. It's important for God's people. Uh, to, to set an example. It's important for God's people to, to love and live and, and, and do the things of God. Not And it, this this covers so many different things, but it's important for God's people. If, if I talked to a friend of mine today and he was saying how angry he was at somebody in his family. And he just wasn't going to talk to no more. And I said, now you got to remember our responsibility um, as Christians is to be an example. I said, now, how are you going to tell other folk not to forgive if you can't forgive somebody in your family? And then he said, I'm going to call you back later. <laughs> so about an hour later, he called me back. He said, what? He said, you might have a point there. He said, show where I said it in the Bible. I showed him. He said, okay, I'm going to have to let this go. He said, because what I don't want to do is two things. I don't want to be a bad example for my children and hating their aunt. And he said, second thing is, he said, I know that revenge 
and and grudge could eat you up alive. And 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 this is effect ostensibly in this context what he is saying. What we're saying, we have to be an example. He had to be an example. This family, we as Christians, had to be an example to the, to the body of Christ, new believers, and the world, and to the things of God. How else will they see how we love, how God's love for us, if we don't love each other? How else can can the world see um, the, the devotion we have for God if they don't see us being devoted to God? And so this is why Nehemiah took the time to run Jehida away from him. Now, verse twenty nine, he says this, and this is very. He didn't. This is the first only time he said this. He said, "Remember them, oh my God." because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. It's almost like he's saying, God, don't take this charge from them. God, keep this in your in their file. Keep this in their records. That these men, Jehida and Elisha, have defiled the priesthood and they have defiled the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. God, he's, he's saying, God, remember this. Then he says in verse 30, he that cleansed out of them from all strangers and appointed the wars of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. He said, I got rid of the problem. And I focus everybody up back on doing those things that connected God's people in communion with him. And finally, he says in verse 31, and for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, he said, I got them back to doing those things that kept a nation focused on God. And he closed out by saying, remember me, oh my God, for good. As I look at these last words, as we look at the very end of the historical accounts of the people of God, what it reminds us again is nothing more that in their own strength, Israel, the people who saw the power of God, who heard the word of God, who ex experienced the miraculous capability that God had to unify his people. The same people who loved the Lord so much that they would ask for his word, who had a revival on the street by the water gate. The same people who cried out to God and the same people who did a historical account of all that God had done and then recognizing their their frailty and the frailty of their people and the, and the mercy of God. The same people who resolved to say, I'm going to follow God fail because of the weakness of the flesh. What does that tell us? We cannot live for God in our minds. We have to live for God by work, by being engaged in relationship with him. Listen to this, and allow his spirit to guide us and strengthen us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit is the only way that we can live according to the will of God. We can't live it because we're smart. We can't live it because we work hard. We can't live it because we, we say we're right. we got to trust God obey God and walk with God that God may take us to where he wants us to be and in doing so we have the joy of fellowship with God and then we have the peace of the knowledge that we are in God's will this book, this book shows us matter of fact not just Nehemiah but all of the all of the accounts the book of Judge the book of Joshua every time we see people try to do things in their own power we see them fail, but every time people allow God to, to guide and direct them, they find we find that they're in a good place. And with us, we don't have a pillar of fire, we don't have a cloud, but what we do have is the power of the Holy Spirit, day and night, to lead us and to guide us. And as we obey God and trust God, obey and trust together, they work together, we'll find ourselves operating in the mighty river of the power of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. When, we, when we're there, fear walks away. When we're there, doubt, has to take refuge somewhere else. When we're there, joy flows in our hearts. When we're there, peace uh, controls and, and operates and protects our minds. And when we're in that place, we are walking in ex and living in the expectation of God continuing to take care of us and bless us in all the ways he can. I'll stop tonight at 727. But I thank God for each of you. And I thank God for all y'all who've been so faithful in the book of Nehemiah. We have covered 13 chapters. I don't know when we started. Um, it seemed like it wasn't that long ago, but we have covered a quite a bit of distance. And I pray that the words that God has shown us through the book of Nehemiah would give us great joy in, in, in what we're about to do uh, this week. And I think y'all saw it this, this coming week. Um, I don't know if Sister Simpson here, um, Reverend, Mr. Sister Thomas, you make sure that tomorrow night we have on here um, the flyer about our churchwide fast on next week. Make sure that we have that and make sure that anybody who wants it, um, it's going to be on the St. Peter Facebook page and we're going to make it available uh, for everybody. But what I, I say to say that we're going to do in preparation for Easter as a church, we're going to get our hearts and minds focused on God. That we may experience the revival that God is ready to break forth in our midst. That's what we're going to do. And that's what we learned in Nehemiah. We learned that there was a need for crying out and fasting and praying.
what we're going to do together. And then after that, we're going to be ready to let God re continue to build us until he brings us back together. And when that happens, we're going to be gathered, ready to walk in and, and the victoriousness and the victory that God has already planned for us. It's already there. Picture it right here. We're just walking into it. I'll stop tonight, but I pray that we remember these things um, in our lives and remember how to continue to live on God. So it is on Facebook. So if y'all got Facebook, go get, go get it, pull it off. You know, take a picture of it and send it to somebody else in the church. Um, but it's going to be, and since we're not in church, it'll be on the screen Sunday. But we're going to do it fast. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow night. I'll talk more about it. And I specifically talk about it Saturday so that we can understand how it works for us. Let us close in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we say thank you for your grace and your mercy, your peace, your joy, and your love. We thank you for all these things, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for together you allow us to walk through the book of Nehemiah being inspired, that a broken people were made unified. A unified people were revived by your word. A revived people were convicted by what they learned, but a convicted people, is, instead of being uh, so mired in sorrow, were instead lifted up in joy of the fact that you loved and moved in their hearts. And we pray, God, that you'd help us experience all these things in our lives, that you rebuild us, strengthen us, restore us, bring us together as a body of believers in unity, and let that unity, Lord, uh, break out in us, Lord, that we may have a true desire desire and thirst for your word, thirst for your presence and thirst for your power. And we pray, God, that those things that we need to avoid, that we will avoid, that we may continue to walk to you, with you, and for you as we look toward eternity in you. It is in Jesus' name we pray, God, that you would let bless every household, every individual believer, and bless every family that is represented on this phone and Zoom line tonight. And beyond that, Lord, we pray that you let your word get in our hands, our feet, our hearts, our minds, our ears, and let it get on our lips, tongue, vocal cord, and lungs. We may declare your word to a dying world, declare it to each other, and declare it to ourselves. Bless us now. Keep us now. It is in Jesus' name we say thank you, Lord, and amen. Thank you, St. Peter, for Zoom line. Thank you, phone line. I also want to remind All everyone that, that I want to remind everybody that, that we will begin our Holy Week services. Um, this coming Sunday every and every night we'll be on Zoom and we'll be on um, the phone line and we'll be on Facebook Live uh, uh, as we have our Holy Week services. Each night we'll have a sermon, a sermon by one of the ministers on the resurrection. And so we'll be having an expectation moment Easter week service uh, starting this Sunday night. May God bless you. May God keep you. I love each other. Hold on, Zoom. Hold on, Zoom. Got sister, my cousin, Sister Phyllis Meadows. Mm, Got sister good. Mary, <laughs> Reverend Leslie. We got Mother Vaughn is on here. Hey, Sister Lena Lewis, good to see you. The Thomases, <laughs> see the Thomases, <laughs> Reverend Stanley. We got Brother Howard Hope on here. Uh, Brother okay. Howard Hope on here. Sister Howard. Howard. Brother Howard. Brown. Hey, Pastor. Sister Howard. Brown. Sister Alice Simpson. Thank you. Sister Kevin Reese. Sister Bernie King. Sister Felicia Henderson. Reverend McClady. Who else we got here? I got a whole other page to go. And Sister Roxanne, I love y'all and I see y'all on the